Hi, welcome to the Cafe Tele uh, live broadcast, Standard Operating Procedure, where we're here to show you tips, tricks, tactics, and techniques to love a career in telecoms. Today, we're going to be talking about automation techniques. These are techniques that you can use inside your workbooks to make them reusable and automated so that it's as easy as possible every time you bring in new data. Now, I say that carefully, bring in new data, because not everybody thinks of update as bringing in new data. But what I mean is when you take new data and insert it into your workbook, for example, if it's a monthly dashboard, you might import data from the last month. You, there's, I can always think of four ways to do this. One would be you just type the data yourself. There are dashboards or reports like that. Another would be that you copy and paste from an external source, maybe a log file, or perhaps you've got a script that exports data in a specific format and you can copy and paste that. Uh, a third way would be um, that you import a CSV or some kind of formatted file that imports very nicely into Excel. That's the third way to bring in new data to your dashboard or recurring report. And then the fourth and last way I can think of is uh, if you have some kind of uh, linked uh, linked or a structured query, a SQL or something that connects off to a database. Myself, I've never done that. I don't know how to do that, but I have heard that it's possible. So most commonly, it's either type it yourself, copy and paste it, or import like a CSV. OK, no matter how you bring in that data, you want to make it as easy as possible for your report or your dashboard to reflect that new data. And I always talk about the two step process. I've just shared the first step that is bring in the new data in whatever technique using whatever technique you normally use. Bring in the latest data. The second step, refresh your pivot tables and it's done. Really, that's all. Two steps. That's all there is to it. A two-step process. Bring in the new data. Refresh your pivot tables. So today I'm going to show you some of the techniques you use to build a dashboard or report so that it is updatable with that simple two-step process. Again, bring in the new data. Refresh your pivot tables. So I'm going to share my screen again and get my ugly face off the screen and show you my workbook. I see we have uh, Ernesto Alejandro. Welcome. Welcome from the country of Chile. I remember you from last week and many previous episodes. I'm always grateful when you show up. Look, I know you guys are busy. I know you have families. It's a, it's a Sunday. So I'm very honored and grateful that you'll take your time to be with me here so that we can all get a little bit better with some of our telecom techniques. I often say that most telecom pros like us, we hate Excel. Um, I've never met a telecom pro who wanted to be an Excel expert, and I certainly will never teach you to be an Excel expert. But it's my belief that we do so many things in telecoms using Excel that Excel is a fundamental tool for telecoms. It's like a hammer for a carpenter or a wrench for a plumber it's just a basic tool, and it's very hard to do good telecoms if you can't use this basic tool. So I'm all about teaching you to master some very basic functions in Excel, only functions and possibly menu selections, no programming, no visual basic, no VBA, no plugins, simple functions that you can type in or pick from the menu and that's how you can automate your workbooks to give you really, really good data and make you look like a star to your coworkers and your boss. That's what's important. So let's get to it. All right. Let's uh, share my workbook. And as always, I'm going to share my whole screen. So just ignore all the other mess you see on my screen. But it helps me to uh, helps me to present these. And there we go. So what I've got in advance here is just some data. This is data. It's mock data. I created it myself. 
Um, if you've got a dashboard or a report that you're working on and you would like some help with it, DM me or send me a message in email or something and let's talk about it. I would love to help you and maybe even use your situation for one of these episodes to illustrate a specific technique to automate dashboards and reports. Uh, or if you're building a model and would like some help, still, I'd love to help you. And what I'd really like to do in either case is we'll, we'll work together just like this and have a video of it. And then we can share the video on YouTube. We'll work together to make sure there's no proprietary information. But I just would like to share what you're doing, because if you're doing it, there's somebody else out there that's doing it as well. So if we could work together on that, we can help other people acquire the same skills that you'd learn working with me one on one. OK, let's get started with standing operating procedure. This is episode 24 and we're going to work on automation skills. The information I've got here is uh, it's just time stamp data. Entries made throughout the day, various days. Uh, site is like a base station ID. If you have a mobile background, this would just be like a site number or whatever unique identifier is used for that particular base station. Uh, it's artificial because I know those identifiers are a lot more complicated. These days, every site will have, uh, you'll, you might have in your identifier, you might have sector information, you might have different technologies, uh, GSM, CDMA, or uh, uh, G3, G4, uh, 3G, 3, 4G, 5G. So your identifiers get pretty, co pretty complicated. Nonetheless, this site in this example is a unique identifier. And then this last one is a uh, milestone. Overall, this data comes from if you were running, uh, let's say, in your network, you had to do a firmware update in all of your sites. Maybe your cluster, every site needed a firmware update or you were adding a sec, uh, excuse me, adding a carrier to a, Oh, pardon me. Adding a carrier to a site. Um, this is just a simple checklist to uh, of that of things that need to be done to complete that overall task. Uh, I'll show you what I mean a little more. Well, let's let's just get to it. So here's the actual workbook. I call this my B BTS project tracker. I suppose these days it would be an enode B or a genode B project tracker, maybe just a RAN project tracker. Um, here's the uh, the dashboard. Here's what the dashboard looks like. I know you can't see that, so let's make that a little bit bigger. What happened? I was pushing the wrong button, so to undo all that. And I want to show you my dashboard again. That's the right button. So this is just a dashboard, and it comes out as a nice one pager. It prints really nice. And you can see what it shows is these are uh, weekly. It's a weekly snapshot. So what we have here is each of the last 10 weeks of data. And these are the various uh, metrics that we're following. These are the tasks in our project checklist. And this is all the completion data. Yeah. And then I've got some graphs here that show it. Uh, looks like I never quite finished it. We'll get. I'll get back to that sometime, I'm sure. Um, no difference. OK, so that's just the basic dashboard. And here's the, the raw data that goes into that dashboard. But like this of itself is not very useful because I'd want to track this. That was a weekly dashboard. So what I typically would do would be a week number. So here's my week number. And on previous episodes, I've told you, I always try and use my own color scheme. And I always use the same one because I want my peers to get used to seeing my colors. So whenever they see something that I produced, they don't need to see my name to see, oh, this is Russell's workbook. So I always use the same colors. You can see I use the light yellow for input. I use the blue. 
the light blue as a highlight for the uh, labels or column headers, row headers. Blue is the text color. I use purple here to be things you shouldn't change. Usually that's formulas. But the yellow indicates this is where you might type something. You know? So that's my color scheme. That's my branding. So with the week number, well, of course, there's a week number function. And you can look into this yourself. I'll encourage you to do that. But the week number comes from a date. And then there's a bunch of different choices that the week num function allows you to determine when your week starts. Um, there's about 10 of those options. Uh, I encourage you to check the um, to check the Excel documentation so that you can pick the one that makes sense for you. That doesn't look. Oh, yeah, it does. OK, so this is. January 12, so it's week two. I need to uh, shrink this down a little bit so I can see what you guys are doing. And you're not doing anything, and that's fine. There we go. So I can uh, just double click and fill this down. I guess I better fill it up first. And you can see that it changes as these dates change, the week number changes. And now, if I enter some new data, uh, say 1 slash 29, I better get my year right, otherwise it'll goof things up. So that'll still work, but I don't have uh, any time. So there's a, did that do what I wanted it to do? Oh, yeah. I want to paste the format so it looks consistent. So now, anytime I add data to this workbook, I'll automatically get the work the week number. Uh, that's by week. I could do the same thing with the day. So how did I type that uppercase? Or the hour. And I think I'm going to cover this next week, but I just want to illustrate, since I've got a date here, I can create several different reports from one set of data. Here's a weekly report. I'll use week num. Here's a uh, daily report. Better. For a daily report, I just want... I don't want the hourly component. I just want the day. And you might think, oh, well, why don't you just do this, Russell? Link to this and then format it as a day. I use the shortcut. Uh, I'm on a Mac command one or on Windows. I think it's uh, control one. And it brings up this format cells dialog box. Nice time saver. Um, I like this date day format. Now, you might think, gee, Russell, there's your day. But remember, Excel stores dates internally as the number of days since January 1 of 1900. And any decimal component or fractional component, that's the hours, minutes, seconds. So you can see here, if I change the format to be just a number, right? I didn't just make it a number. Let's make it general. You can see it's just a number with a decimal component. The number is the, the integer component to the left of the decimal point is the number of days since January 1, 1900. And the decimal component, the part to the right of the decimal point or the fractional component, that represents the number of hours. So if I reformat that, but look what I've got here. I just copied that, so I'm going to get the decimal component. So I don't want that, because if I try to use this in a pivot table, pivot table will be all over the place. I just want the day. So I would use the day component. I'll go back to that. Yeah, okay. The day component would, would be uh, use the date function. And I'll 
I'm going to, there's three arguments to the date function, year, month, day, and I get it all from my timestamp column. Once again, the timestamp column. And if I just want the day without the QR component, I'll click there again. Oh, sorry. E2. What did I do wrong? Day, year, month, day. There we go. And if I uh, strip away the formatting, you see it's only the integer value. Same thing here. 43475, that's the number of days since January 1, 1900. I have the same thing in this column. So it's all good. And then I would fill that down. So I only get the day component. Uh, I think that's enough about that for now. I don't want to get lost. Um, again, like I said, I think next week I'm going to spend some more time on this because I think that's an important uh, characteristic here is one set of data can be used to produce many reports. One set of data can be used to produce many reports, all in the same workbook and all automated. Refresh the pivot tables and all of your reports are updated. So, for example, in this case, I might, if the project is long enough, meaning it extends over, you know, several months, I might want to create a monthly report. So you can see I've already got a the basis for a weekly report here in the daily column. I could have a, a daily report if that was useful for somebody. I could also do an hourly report. This is possible because we've included, it's a timestamp, so it includes an hourly component. Many times if it's manually entered data or usually manually entered data, it'll be just the, the integer day, you know, just uh, March 7th, 2021. Machine data will often be in this timestamp format that includes the hours, minutes, seconds. Uh, but whatever your data set looks like, you can produce different reports from the same data set. It really depends on what you want to show. How are we doing? Do we have any questions? Probably already know this. Yeah, this is pretty good stuff. The idea of producing multiple reports from one data set hinges on the principle that you are always, you always should separate your data from your presentation layer or sep the data is also some people would call that content you would separate the content from your presentation and the idea of making multiple reports from one set of data would be multiple presentations or multiple views of that one data set. Easy to do. In fact, I could, uh, I don't think I've got one on this computer right now, but I could. I've got one on my other computer. Um, okay, so let's see, that was automation. So I've just shown you, this is all what I would call synthetic fields is Here's your raw data, right? Call them EFG, that's the raw data. But week number is a synthetic field because I have synthesized my week number field or column based upon the timestamp field or column. Same with the daily column. I can do same thing, another synthetic field. Uh, maybe you use a unique site identifier in your network, it's really common, but sites typically have a name in, in your language, a name that everyone knows. And it's just easier for humans to kind of focus on a name rather than a number. So if this column here is your site IDs, this might be your site name. I've borrowed for this example, from the Greek alphabet. These are the name of the Greek letters. And for each of these 23 sites, I've assigned a Greek, the name of a Greek letter. So 
I'm going to use that. Uh, I'm going to name this sites. This is my sites lookup. It's just a named range. So when I use sites lookup in a function or a formula, it refers to this range of cells. So back here, I have the site number and in my sites lookup, that's the first column here of our sites lookup range. So now the way we would use that, one way would be a VLOOKUP, the vertical lookup, which is just VLOOKUP. And then here's what we're looking up, the site number or the unique identifier. And then it was my range, right? So it says uh, the table array. That's the range I just created. And I'm going to call that up by using a shortcut, function F3. And there's my range. And then I want... We'll go back and look at my data. We'll do that in just a second. But I know the first column is the site number. The second column, that's the site name. So here would be a two. There's a fourth value that you don't have to use, but I encourage you to use it. Just makes it more complete. I don't really like to assume hidden default values. So I generally will add that um, if I think of it. Um, and I'm going to use false so it will only match exactly. And that's kind of an error checking capability. If I use false there, meaning it will only give an exact match. If somebody types a site ID that isn't in my table, I'll get an error. And that would force me to go back and say, probably that would happen either as a mistake by the person who entered this data or Maybe we've added a new site and I need to add that site number to my table. So there's my completed function, the VLOOKUP, and site 12 is site name pi. Let's take a look. So you can see it's in order. So site 12, column two in my range has the name pi. By the way, don't forget, one week from day is pi day. <laughs> you all know pi, right? 3.14, 3.141592. Every engineer learns that for some reason. You see it so many times as you're at university that everybody knows that. Uh, next Sunday is 314. 3.141592. <laughs> There's pi, but everybody, they say three, that's pi. Pi Day, 14 March is Pi Day. Okay, that's not useful. <laughs> All right, so there's my lookup. I've created a new synthetic field based upon lookup. So I can fill that down just by double clicking that little, remember this knot here is called the fill handle, right? Um, for now, I'm not gonna worry about these errors. They come because I don't have any data out here. So that's okay. What I want, what I'm trying to show you is just the automation steps. So these are synthetic fields and there are other things that you might do. So if you look back at my dashboard, I have completion percentages in my, sure, I've got a look up here inside this, uh, my uh, BTS project tracker that includes project waiting, or excuse me, task waiting. What's the, you know, some tasks are really easy. Some tasks are much more difficult. You can include that level of ease or difficulty in your project so that, you know, if the, if the, if the beginning tasks were very easy and you had half of the tasks in any site done, you might think you're half done. But if the later tasks are much more difficult, you might have the easiest tasks done, but that doesn't mean you're half done, right? If, if their task waiting means the later tasks carry a much heavier load. I didn't show that here. It's a little, little bit more complicated, but that's another synthetic field you might 
Institute, if you look at my updates, this is my raw data. So here's the week at a time that we've just done. This is the site completion. This is for this task, getting the pad ready. I said that 9%, that was 9% of the overall project, just getting the pad ready. And I did that. That's another V lookup. Pad ready is right there, and it's 9%. So again, it's a synthetic field. It's a synthetic field. And I use that to, I don't have to ask my field workers who are actually doing this work. I only need these three values to complete my dashboard or my report, but I use, I can infer a lot of additional information from these three simple values. That's a key technique is, especially when you're relying on field forces because they're busy too. Don't ask them for a bunch of data you don't really need because it's already hard to get them to comply. Okay, enough about that for now. We've got these, and remember, I like to color my synthetic fields so people don't overwrite them. I usually put a, a purple-ish color there. And for the record, I raw input, I usually make that yellow. It just It's just a cue to whoever's filling this out. If it's a shared workbook, like on a Microsoft SharePoint site or something like that, um, somebody else would know, okay, it's yellow. Here's where the raw data gets typed in or pasted in. Okay, that's the synthetic fields. We've done the I used a couple of different date variations. I did the V lookup based upon the uh, the uh, sites lookup data range. And let's look at that for a second. Here, all I've got is the site name and the region. The example I just gave was a completion percentage. That's another example. Um, here's a region. Right. If this site is a part of a region or maybe it's a part of a cluster, this is all information that you can derive or synthesize simply by having the site ID. And what I did with this was I asked the field forces. Almost halfway through, I don't want to say much about this, but. The way I implemented this is the field forces, whenever they completed a task, they would send a two fields of data. Hey, Denia, how you doing? Welcome, thanks for joining us. Um, when the field forces would complete a task in this project list, they would send two pieces of information on our Slack channel. I set up a dedicated Slack channel and all they had to do was give me the site number, comma, and the milestone. I could, in as long as they were doing it in real time, meaning as soon as they completed the task, they put the site number and the, the milestone into the, that Slack channel. I could infer the timestamp from Slack because Slack would record when that message was sent. So they didn't have to type the time. Now, if they, um, if they weren't keeping up with this and maybe at the end of the day or heaven forbid the end of the week, they added all this information. Well, they'd have to put they'd have to put the times in if they want the times to be recorded accurately. Yeah. But again, the point there is structure your data thinking, you know, I want to make it as easy as possible for my colleagues out in the field to give me this data. So two values, site ID and milestone typed into a Slack channel. How much easier can it get? It's it's just that's as easy as that's as easy as it could be. And you get a lot of information from your Slack channel if you've got an automation set up beyond the scope of this meeting. But you can get, as I said, you can get that you can infer the timestamp. Pardon me, the timestamp. Um, you also know whose email, you know, who was logged in into Slack that sent that. You could get their email address or their Slack. Boy, pardon me, their Slack ID. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, probably WebEx teams. I've never done that, but probably the same. It's simply another automation, also free, 
but an automation. Okay, let's continue on here. I don't want to cut out. Uh, so the next thing is I've just shown you a bunch of synthetic fields, how you can add value. You can infer values based on a very limited data set. And that's what we've done here. <clears throat> uh, the next thing I want to do is I need to automate what's the latest date in my workbook. So you can see the latest date is January 29. Remember that internally Excel tracks dates as the number of days since January 1, 1900. So we can get the latest date. Boy. The latest date, how could we do that? Remember, it's the number of days since January 1, 1900, and it's stored as a number, a, a, just an, uh, a, a, a whole number, integer value plus the uh, fractional component. Since it's a number, the largest number in my data set is the latest data. So I would use the max function on this column. Now, that includes the fractional component. Depending on the report I want to create, this might be better phrased as timestamp. And then you would have a different one that would be latest day. And this would be max, but use a different column. So now this will be the latest timestamp, including including the hour, hour, minute, seconds. But this is just going to be this is just going to be the day. No fractional component. So. Now, I automatically know what's the latest value in my workbook. And I'm going to focus on this one because it just it's easier. <laughs> you get a little more uh, interesting stuff. And that's a link, so I better color it, right? That's the latest day. But, you know, sometimes, like with this tracker, this tracker somebody might said hey two weeks ago right or maybe you know three months ago for a long project it, you might have a situation where somebody would ask about the dashboard how it looked a certain period ago since all of the dates in your work in your report or your dashboard are going to derive from this latest day you could derive them from uh, you could set up a different you could set up a different day that someone could enter manually if they wanted to so this is what i'm going to do is let's say that's january 29th that's the default date right but if I wanted, let's say, uh, January 1st, now it would be an if function. If there's a value there, use it. Otherwise, use the default. So right now, because there's a value there, that's what I'm going to use. If I remove that value, my dashboard is just going to be current for the present time. But since the whole thing is going to derive from this value, I can trigger, I can change. And I'm going to show you that. I think we'll get around to this. It might take a little more than an hour. But once again, and I want to name that. 
date used. So there's how you automate the latest date inside your workbook. So you don't have to do anything when you update, when you bring in your latest data, you already have automatically you get whatever that latest data is as the latest date in your automation here and your report's going to use that. So the next step would be, let's say this is, I'm using days. So let's imagine this is a daily report. So maybe for your stats, maybe the sites that in your cluster, you have a daily report and you want to see, um, you know, the stats from yesterday, maybe you import a CSV that's exported from your OSS, the vendor provided OSS, or you have some other tool that's generating stats and you paste them in here. Well, I want to show much like with my dashboard here, this shows the trailing 10 weeks. I might want to show the last two weeks or 14 days. How do we automate that? Well, our date, the challenge here, we found the last date using Max. I've shown you this layer of abstraction so that I can so that I can override the default max date. Um, the next thing I need to know is I'm going to have, I said um, from my other, from here I might want to show the last 10 or 14 days, right? So I need to have a count. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of arguing with myself how to, what order to show this in. We've already done the date function, so let's do that. And now I have the date used. I want to use that. I want all my dates to be tied to the date used. Did I do that wrong? I did. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I'll have to go back and fix it. Date used. Close out the month. And then now it's day. Date used. But it's broken because that's date used. I made a mistake. So I need to change it. That should be the named range, date used. I did the label rather than the actual date itself. I oopsed but I can fix that. Date used says config C7. I want config B7. And I just changed it. So now I should get a date. What else did I type wrong there? Oh, month has a P in it. Yeah, so now I get a date and I can do Uh, so there's my, that's the current day. How would I get yesterday? Well, remember the, the way internally Excel tracks days is the, excuse me, let me say that again. Internally, the way Excel manages dates is the number of days since a date in the past. That means number of days, if I subtract one, that's yesterday. If I subtract two, that's the day before yesterday or Friday, et cetera. So here, if I just do, well, I don't want to do this, but here's the simplest thing because it's just a number, right? One January of 21, if I subtract one, is December 31st of 20. If I delete that, so now 29, 28. But there's a problem using actual numbers in there. If I use a fill handle, it doesn't work, right? Really, the, the simp, it did work. Son of Oh, <laughs> the reason, it, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason it worked is the fill handle is changing. This is cell B24. This fill handle 
went to B25, B26, B27. Yeah. But that's not good. That's not good best practice. What would be better is you really want every formula in a contiguous range means all the cells together. You want the formula to be the same. And this formula is different than this formula. Now, all these are the same, but that one's different. And that's not good practice. Better practice would be to make them all the same. And to do that, I could have the same one, the same formula, but my first, what I'm subtracting first would be zero. So that's the rows function. Uh, C24, you have to anchor it. Okay, still hear me? I pushed the wrong button and that would cause you confusion, I think. So I want to subtract zero, so let's subtract one from that. So I said two weeks. So now I can make this all the same. I'm subtracting one. I'm just going to subtract that column. And now all my formulas are identical. The only thing that's changing is the link minus C24 minus C25 minus C26, right? So I found a way to get an incremental count inside a formula. There's another way to do that, though. Why not just put the rows function inside the formula instead of making an external reference? And since there's a minus sign there, I changed that to a plus. And now, just embedded, I get the same dates, but I don't need this. I don't need this column. So if I just delete that, rats, <laughs> I'm going to have a problem here. What did I do wrong? Uh, first, I want to push this back over to the right. And then why did I have an error here? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm here in B, B2, uh, B24. And I have to anchor it. Colon, B, B, B24. And now if I fill that down, there you go. So now here's my trailing 14 days. I like this approach because I can do it like this as well. Oh, let's just copy that to make our life simpler. Uh, I'm going to use C, but I'm not going to use it on the day. Now I'm subtracting one from the month. So here's my last 10 months. Cool, huh? So I already know what the last 14 days or the last 10 months. Here's 14 months if you insist. Yeah. I've automated this date and all the previous dates. These are the dates I'm going to track. Remember, here was my dashboard. Here's the last four weeks. I could do exactly the same thing, I think, with the week number. Um, yeah, I could do the same thing, but I would just use this or this, right? I don't have to embed the date because I've already done that.
I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Yeah. Anyway, I've got the dates automated because where I want to go is a dashboard. I'm going to have a column of dates and you can see it's just a lookup. I've automated those dates in another place uh, out here. Not out here. It's way out to the right. I'm not going to. I will. There's another look up here in here someplace. I can't find it. There's so many. Look up here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Here's where all my dates are. Year week, week date, all that stuff. So I just want to have a dashboard. I have to have the week, the weeks or the date that's incrementing. I need that in advance. And in my example, I was going to show a daily dashboard. So if I set up a dashboard workbook and I do it exactly the same way, all, all my dashboards look the same. This would be date for day, right? And it's just going to be a link for this here. This is kind of tedious, but you only do this once. Once you set up, you can see I ran out of days right there, right? So this might be kind of the basis for my dashboard. Uh, and here's my days, right? So now the question is, all right, well, what about what values go into my dashboard? Here's where you need pivot tables, okay? So I don't want to get ahead of myself. Check my notes. How you doing? Anybody else? Everybody still with me on this? So let's let's recap real quick because this is good stuff. Here's your raw data, the yellow cells. I created three synthetic fields or synthetic columns completely derived from this raw data. These two I derived using a date function or a week num function. And this was a lookup into this table. I simply use the site ID to index and get the name for at each site. That's all I did. Then I used a max function to find out, to automatically set up what's the latest date of data. Okay. And I gave myself an override so that if I said, let's go back a little farther. If I set up an override date, I've got all the I've got all the dates I want to show in my report or dashboard. I produce those days automatically. I produce those days automatically. And now in my dashboard, there's my days. Starts on December 1. If I come back here and reduce my over remove my override, I'm back to January 29th of 2019. So uh, let's, what's the next step here? Uh, these are my notes, pardon. Okay, the next step before you create a pivot table, and that's the way we're going. I mean, it's all kind of sequential. This is how, this is how I set up all of my dashboards is first I set up the data. I do my synthetic fields. I do my date automation with an override. Um, I create the, you know, the previous X number of dates so that I can automatically produce those dates. I put them into a dashboard like you see on screen right now. Um, and then I, I'm preparing to set up my pivot table. That's going to be next. But I want my raw data. I always want to feed the correct amount of data to my pivot table. I don't want to what a lot of people do. I've seen this a thousand times with the engineers I've worked with or the ones that have worked for me. They will say, okay, every time I add data to my workbook, I'm going to have, you know, the pivot table needs to accept that new data. So why don't I just, you know, imagine that we go down about row 100 here. I'll just make the my data table really big. <clears throat> and then 
and highlight all that data, even the blank stuff, and make that, if I'm going to insert a pivot table, insert a pivot table. Once I've selected it, Excel, uh, I clicked, sorry. Try again, insert pivot table. Excel automatically puts the selected data into the range for my pivot table. This is the data source, right? Well, what happens when I enter the 110th data? I still have to come back and change my pivot table. So you could make it really far into the future, right? Let's try this on a new worksheet. And we'll just, uh, good practice is always give a meaningful name to your worksheets. Don't leave it as sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. Um, regional sites. Um, I guess I better go back to my data. Add a field, and that's how easy this is. I'm going to add the, excuse me, region. I ate something that must not agree with me. Equals, it's that VLOOKUP again, right? And I'm still using the site. And I'll use the shortcut there. Remember, was Control F3. Sites look up. Only this time it's going to be, boy, that didn't come out right. Column three was the region, and I like to use false, right? Yeah. I need a comma after three. Sorry about that. So now I get my region. I can just double click. And uh, I don't know. See, I just added another column. Did that change my data source for the pivot table? Pivot table analyze, change data source, B to H. Yeah, it did. Okay. Excel smart enough to do that. Okay. So now I've got a, pivot, a, a source for my pivot table. Let's say I want to have a uh, region and just a count of sites. That won't work, not sites. That's some I'd want count. This is just going to count uh, how many updates, essentially, I had for each region in my data set. I'm just trying to illustrate the point, but look at this. I've got this NA, and uh, let's see, what else did I have in there? That's all I've got. Often, when you've got blank data in your pivot, in your data source, you'll end up with a blank uh, entry in your pivot table. And that's as ugly as this is. So what I always do is I use a named range to describe my data so that instead of having – where's my pivot table? Instead of having a – an explicit range. I want a named range there, a special name range. I've done this before. Ernesto Alejandro, you know this one from last week, a dynamic named range. This is a named range whose size changes depending on the data. Ooh, I'm about out of time here. I'm not going to stop. I want to show you this because this is really important for automating. Um, I'm going to create a new range and my new range is going to be uh, raw data, and it's a dynamic named range. Always uses the offset function. I've covered the offset function before. <clears throat> uh, I'll start here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, I better start up here in row one, because this is a pivot table source and I need the row of column, I need the column headers included in the source. So the offset function has five arguments. The first one is the essentially the upper left-hand corner of your data. No row offset, 
a zero row offset, a zero column offset, because I do want that specific uh, that specific uh, B1 is where I want to start. And now, how many rows are there? Well, I want to count the number of rows is where I've got data. If there's no data in the timestamp function, I don't have an entry. So I know there will always be a timestamp. So let's use, since there's a, number, a timestamp there, I want to count how many of those cells have data. And that's just column F. Now the way the count function works, count returns a one for every cell that contains a number. But that's not going to work for us. And I'll show you why here. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. So let's look. One good test of a, a, na a, for uh, a named range is select it and click inside its definition. I'm deficient one. I counted the timestamps and I got one less than I wanted, right? Well, that's because count returns a one for every cell that has a number. Cell F1 is a label that is not a number. So count did not count that. Two things I could do. First thing I could do is just add one. Since I know I've got a column header of one, add one to it. And now if I click in here, now my count plus the one, my data is all defined. That's a good way. Another one is use the count A function. Count A returns a one for every cell that is not empty or blank. And I say that carefully because blank is a character. So if there's a, if I hit the space bar, if I enter a blank character, count A would return a one for that. So I'm just trying to use the proper language here. Count A returns a one for every cell in its range that has a value that is not blank, that is not null, right? So I can use count A, but I also added that one. So with count A, I don't need the plus one. And now if I click there, see, I've selected all my data from B1 all the way to H44, okay? That's what I want. Now I'm going to add data here just because it uh, it's it's awkward to have have it blank. I just didn't. I added one row to uh, illustrate. Let's in fact let's do it the other way. I'm just going to delete that. I deleted that. Now if I check my named range, it's one smaller because I deleted data. Perfect. Exactly what we want. One more thing though. While you're developing this. Um, Maybe I'm setting up, this is the, I'm setting up the first pivot table for some value in my dashboard. I might create additional pivot tables based on other values. And to do that, I might have to insert more columns, more synthetic fields. If I insert the, a set, synthetic field now, the definition is going to break because I hard coded a seven. If I insert another co column, another synthetic field, this goes to eight. Well, I don't want to have to continually change this, but we can do exactly the same thing with this argument to offset that we did with the previous argument. The count A, this is the height in rows. Seven is the width in columns. Well, let's do the same thing. and row one, and then close it out. And now it should still, no change, it's accurate. Now, if I add another column, so let's say, uh, I don't know, um, doesn't matter, uh, month. 
Let's do. So here would be equals date, year, All I'm just trying to do is add another column to my data so that you see the definition for this named range remained accurate even after I added a column. And I always want a month to be on the same day, so I'm going to hard code a one. That way every month will show up in that on the first day of the month. The pivot table likes that. Uh, and I like this definition. Now, if I click it, yeah, so everything's in. But now I have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight columns in my data. But if I check my formula, my dynamic named range for raw data, I get it. See, see the lights around it there? It includes all the data that's defined and nothing that's not defined. So this is fine. Now I need to change my pivot though. My pivot, the data source is no longer this hard-coded uh, range. It is raw data was the name range I use. And if I update that, no change. Again, using a dynamic named range, Anytime you come back and add raw data to your table, right, your dynamic named range will change, which means your pivot definition will change. And as I showed you here with this dashboard, I've got, look how many workbooks I've got. How many workbooks do I have? Yeah, I've got about, sorry, I've got about 20 different worksheets inside this workbook, and a lot of them are pivot tables. Well, they all derive from the exact same raw data. But you can see, I've got quite a few, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got nine synthetic fields in my data table. And all my pivot tables, are using a named range. Uh, boy, I don't even see any pivot tables. There's a pivot table. So if I pivot table analyze and change the data source, updates table, that makes sense because the name of the worksheet is updates, yeah? So all the pivot tables have the exact same dynamic named range as the data source. So they all get updated every time new data is added. That's why I say, remember, two-step process, bring in new data. So in this example, paste in new data here. Well, I could show you right there's some raw data right there. Paste in new data. And then that was the first step. Second step was refresh all the pivot tables. And you do need to have a... Uh, click inside a pivot table and then refresh, select refresh all, all the pivot tables update, your dashboard is updated. Two-step process, bring in the latest data, refresh all, finished. And this dashboard, this complex dashboard with 20 different worksheets feeding it, updates just like that. Isn't that cool? Let's see. Yeah, I showed you both count and count A, and we created a pivot table. Well, the last thing, and we're really running time out of time, but this is the most important part. This is the most important part is uh, I have to have something useful. Oh, okay, I did the we did the region. Menzor, don't ask for jobs like that. That's not good. It's it's not a good idea. Um, so Manzur, excuse me, the to update this table, let's say, let's see what data I created here. Um, 
See, really what I want for most of these dashboards, it's all time-based. And so far, uh, okay, I could do that. So let's have a, uh, I'm going to change this pivot table. I'm going to use my daily as the rows. And now you can see how many updates were applied to each uh, region. How many updates, how to say this, how many tasks were completed in each region for every day, right? So what I would do is come back to my dashboard and what's my order? Is it alphabetical order? East, north, southwest. Yeah, so let's do that. East, north, south, west. And this is, uh, I don't like this, but uh, number of updates. This is not very useful, but I'm just illustrating the point of updates. And now, here's the trick. Here's the trick. Enter an equal sign. The trick is, I'm going to show you a function you may have never seen before. It's an Excel function. It's not a complicated function, but I just never see anybody teaching about it. And it is the most useful function ever for automation. Type an equal sign and then find a pivot table and click in it. Now, all I got is a zero, right? Let's look at this function, and I'm going to copy it. I'm going to paste it out here and remove the equal sign. There's my get pivot function. Let me make it bigger and move it over so you can see it. Okay, there's my get pivot function. And it can have, depending on the pivot table, it can have a lot of different arguments to it. But I'm getting the site, right? The site, and then the, this is really the second argument. The first argument is the name of the value we're pulling out of the pivot table. The second argument is, it's a, re it's a reference or a cell that's in that pivot table. So pivot regional sites A3, A3, it's in that pivot table, right? So I always think upper left-hand corner. Um, then it says region and east. So it's really like attribute value pairs. Here's the attribute is the region and the value is east, right? And then lastly, it has daily is the attribute, and then the date is the value. That's really useful because you can recognize, hey, for the date, I've got the date right there, right? So instead of leaving it hard-coded and it Excel by default puts in the entire date function so it converts itself to a number like Excel expects, uh, let's change that to be that. Uh, I lost a, uh, yeah, extra. I didn't highlight the cell. So now I can fill down and I've got a value, right? Although I get these ref arguments and invariably what the ref argument means is there's no data there. It's not a zero, it's nothing. That's just a characteristic of the get pivot data function. The way to work around that is if error. If the get pivot data function returns an error, it's always because there's no data there. So how do we want to handle that? Show a zero. Yeah, so if error, show a zero. This will make my zero my errors go away. Et voila. Now, what I did there was I changed the value for the daily attribute to be a reference right here. 
Why couldn't I do the same thing for the region attribute? So I'm going to highlight East and click there. One thing you're going to notice, though, I, if I fill down, if I fill down, F9 will turn into F10, F11, F12. That's not what I want. I have to anchor the row. Do function F4. Once it's a fully anchored row and column, F4 again. Now the row is anchored. Did I do that again? Oh, I left an extra quote in there. Let's get rid of that. Now it should work. So now no difference, right? And each, each one shows F9 as the argument. We need to do the same thing with the date function because the date function, the date value, excuse me, is in column E. I want the row to change, so I get these dates as they change, but it's always going to be column E. So I need to change this function F4. Now it, you can see it says E10 fully anchored. If I do it again, I get the row. That's not what I want. And now the third time I use function F4, the column E has the dollar sign. That means it's anchored and the row is not anchored. That's what I want. So now if I do this, all the same values, but since the row is not anchored, excuse me, the column for the region, let's change that by region. Watch this. This is just going to blow your mind. I'm going to fill right. Check that out. Is that cool? Is that the coolest function on the planet? That's the coolest function on the planet right there. And dig this. I built in an override capability, right? I can override instead of the latest date being shown in my dashboard. Uh, I've only got my data only has January data. So let's, um, that means I need to pick my override carefully. So instead of January 28th, the default value, let's look at the dashboard one time, the default value, let's go and look at um, a week before, 1 slash 21 slash 2019. And come back to my dashboard. Check that out. Automatically over. And all the values just changed because these dates are arguments into my kit get pivot data function down here. See, I change this to be, let's pick the first one. I change that one. Excuse me. I changed east to be. Uh, F9, F dollar sign 9, and the date, I changed it to be E10 with the column anchor, dollar E10. I did an upper lowercase there. That's the function, and now I could have done that here and then fill down and fill right in a two-step process and it's all it's all just wonderful um something i guess i should tell you if you've never done the way you do pivot tables if you've never done get pivot data before uh come to the pivot table analyze menu in your ribbon and do field settings wrong uh, oh, options right out here to the far left options, generate, get pivot data. You need to, you may have to select that. There should be a check mark by it. If that's not got a check mark by it, I don't think you're going to get the get pivot data function. You're going to get just the value like a reference. That's not what you want. You want the function. So options and select generate, get pivot data. That's what you want. 
All right. So that's it. You know, okay, now you know my secret. This is how I automate all my dashboards and reports. I've just gone through the entire process for you. Raw data, synthetic fields, date automation, pivot tables. Two-step process every time you update the work to workbook in the future. Bring in, <laughs> bring in your new data. Bring in the latest data. Two, refresh your pivot tables, and it's done. So I think I could show you an example here because I had uh, – Sure. So I've got some raw data here. And before I paste in my raw data, let's delete this override. I hope this doesn't make me lose my raw data that I just copied. But let's paste our data in there. I lost it. Okay, I have to do it again. Copy and uh, yeah, pay special values. And oh, I've got a mistake. Yeah. So I told you that I automated this using um, Slack. And if the field, field technicians and engineers were entering their uh, updates every time they completed a task, if they were doing that in real time, I only needed the first two fields, the site ID and the, the task. I could default the third one, right? But it has to be the, the, the optional field can't be first or second. It must be last. So, uh, and I didn't structure this. So what I'm, I'm going to, cheat here I'm going to cut and insert and now come back and copy my data the date is the last column there it's not formatted but it's in the last column and if I come back to my data and now paste it Yeah, all my data, all these happened right at midnight. I must have done a poor job of that. <laughs> but if I come back to my dashboard, uh, sorry, come back here. My dashboard, you can see I've got dates going out into February, right? But my dashboard won't show them. Why? Anybody know? How come my dashboard isn't showing those dates? I got a whole bunch of new data here, see? February 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. I got a bunch of new data, but it's not showing up in my dashboard. Why? I didn't refresh my pivot table. I imported a bunch of new data. I brought in new data. That's step one. Step two is update your pivot tables. If I check here, I don't have an override. So click inside a pivot table, refresh all. Now I should have February dates in my dashboard, but I don't. Why is that? Uh, did I? Why is that? Oh, oh, no, I did. I've got it in this dashboard. Why are they not here? God, it's like I lied to you. <laughs> Why is my latest day max data in column E? Huh. That's probably, you know, a lot of the Microsoft apps are broken. Uh, are broke. Yeah, it's here. Why didn't this get that? E. That's bizarre. Because look at this. 
So a lot of the apps are broken. Um, A lot of the apps are broken. A lot of the Microsoft apps are broken on on Apple. Um, there's my Max data in column E. Let's redo that. See why that's not right. That's interesting. Why is it not getting these? Oh, it is getting these, but look at my dates. They're from 2014. Well, that's goofy. Yeah, I've got old data here. I changed some of the data. That's my problem. See this? My dates are in 2014. So this date, January 28th of 19, is still the most recent date. Um, I could probably do something really goofy like this. I apologize for this. Now I'm just going to add. Start there. So now we got Ah, this stuff happens. I try to prepare in advance, but I'm not always very good at it. So now let's do our date. This is just adding a random number of days. Okay. And now if I come back to my pivot table and refresh... Yeah, more better. Now my dashboard shows February. I'm sorry about that. I was using data from many years ago, so the data I already had was still the most recent data. Okay, but again, completely updated and automatic. Um, that's about everything I was planning to show you today, and I've gone a little bit over. I apologize for that. We covered... You can see my list here. We covered the various automation skills of synthetic fields based on dates. Yeah, we did VLOOKUPs using uh, a table lookup into uh, site names and site regions. We did date automation, finding the latest date using Max, um, creating the past X number of days or X number of weeks or X number of months. We showed you dynamic name ranges using both count and count A functions. And then we used a pivot table and uh, insert data using get pivot data. So that's everything. Um, I do have a course on this. I'll, uh, I'll be giving you a link to the course here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, not quite ready for that yet, but automating your dashboards and reports is key, you can really sail through this because you get a report like this, get a dashboard like this, and you can update this in literally seconds. You can update this in seconds. Bring in the latest data, refresh your pivot tables, and this is updated completely. Any questions? Any questions in the chat? Are you still with me? Any questions? Well, thanks a lot for joining me. I know it's your Sunday. I appreciate you being here, trying to work on your skills and, and develop your, your telecom skills. Um, we'll be back again next week. Um, who we got here? Somebody wants to speak? Who is that? Dania, Dania, you want to speak? Hang on, I'll click. If, sorry, I didn't see that earlier. Do you have a mic? Do you have a microphone, Dania? Am I saying your name correctly? I apologize. 
Nope, it went away. Okay. Okay, everybody. Join me again next weekend. We're going to do this again. I'm thinking next weekend. Let me check my notes here. I'm thinking next weekend. Uh, wrong notes. Let's see. Uh, next weekend. Maybe I want to spend a little more time on how one column of dates can be, you know, just timestamps, how you would use that to have different dashboards, a daily, a weekly, a monthly. I'll think about that this week. And um, again, the key function there is you're separating the content from the from the presentation. All your data is over here and your dashboards would be over here and they're just linked by the get pivot data function primarily. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, see you again next week. That will be episode 25. And uh, again, I'm sure glad you're here. I appreciate you coming and working hard on your telecoms career. Um, thanks a lot for being with me and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.